Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show today, bringing you another really fascinating guest uh, involved in creating a better tomorrow for so many people out there. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Elizabeth Garner, who is the Chief Scientific Officer for the United States at Ferring Pharmaceuticals, which is a, a major research driven especially biopharma group. They're uh, committed to helping people around the world build families and live better lives, have been busily involved in developing treatments for both mothers and babies the last half a century. Uh, and in addition to leading in, in reproductive medicine and maternal health, they're very active in special areas like GI, urology, as well as uh, new work in the area of the microbiome and orthopedics. Uh, Dr. Gardner has broad responsibility for a United States clinical development, medical affairs, pharmacovigilance, as well as project planning and regulatory affairs. And she has uh, nearly 30 years of experience in both uh, the medicine and, and, and the business side of the industry uh, prior to joining Faring, uh, holding chief medical officer roles for uh, both Abzeva, which was a, a biotech company focused on women's health, as well as agile therapeutics. Uh, earlier in her career, held leadership roles in medical affairs at Myriad Genetics, uh, as well as in clinical development at both Abbott and Merck. Uh, she holds medical degree from uh, from Harvard Medical School, has practiced obstetrics, gynecology, and gynecological oncology and internal medicine at uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Mass Gen. Uh, in addition, uh, she also holds a master's degree in public health from the uh, the Harvard T H Chan School of Public Health and. Uh, a bachelor's degree in in music um, from Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. We're honored to have her with us today. A lot of really interesting themes to get into today. But Dr. Elizabeth Garner, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I, I very much enjoyed reading about you. <laughs> I'm getting ready for this episode. And, you know, I, I would love to really start things off um, by handing you the floor for a little bit. And, and again, you know, what, one of the things I was reading was uh, this interesting piece in, in Brigham and Women's Hospital Bulletin from back in the day where uh, it talked about that, you know, before all this gynecological oncology stuff. You wanted to be an opera singer at one point. I um, would love to hear the the early story about how uh, you went from opera singer to uh, OBGYN and, and, you know, the interesting balance between taking care of patients with ovarian and cervical cancers, but also keeping your eye on, on these major health disparities that uh, still exist, existed then, exist now in the area of women's health. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And uh, you you definitely did your homework there. Yeah. Um... So yeah, to the to the opera singer uh, thing, I realized uh, sort of halfway through college that I just didn't have the power in terms of the voice to be able to do it. So, you know, although I had a, a nice singing voice, it wasn't quite, you know, up to par in terms of what one would need to do. Um, but honestly, I had uh, really thought about being a physician from the age of probably 12, 13. So I knew also that it was more likely I was going to end up in medicine anyway. So that was all fine. Um, one thing I certainly also took away from my uh, four years at Mount Holyoke College is that it's a women's college. And, you know, so I, I mean, I'd already learned from my parents, certainly growing up, that women could do, you know, anything they wanted to do, women could be great leaders. And that was certainly confirmed in those four years at Mount Holyoke. So I went into medical school really thinking about you know, not just taking care of patients, but sort of what could I do kind of beyond that, right? So even early in my 
uh, medical school years, I recognized that I wanted to have bigger impact really than taking care of one patient at a time. And that's really what led me to do the master's in public health. Uh, I also have, of course, the background of growing up in Nigeria, where, you know, I certainly grew up with a, a worldview, right? A very unique worldview, I think. Um, having a mom who was, or is, I should say, from the U.S., a uh, Caucasian woman, and a uh, African dad uh, from Nigeria, you know, you can imagine growing up that, you know, I, I knew and I, I embraced sort of diversity and people of various backgrounds coming together. That was sort of my family, right? And uh, also growing up in Nigeria, but having family in various parts of the world, I just naturally had also a global perspective, right? Which led me to really always be thinking about, you know, diversity and culture and all the factors, right? You know, social economic factors that influence everyone, but certainly women in particular. Um, growing up, I also unfortunately lost a number of relatives, uh, mostly females, to really kind of preventable problems, right? Um, situations where, you know, serious conditions were not identified just because there was no health care or uh, there was lack of access to health care. And, you know, those experiences, you know, seeing relatives, you know, dying of, you know, these conditions that had they been in a different place in the world um, would probably not have happened. You can see how with that experience too, you know, inequities in women's health um, were very important to me, you know, even as a teenager. Um, and so because of that, I think, you know, going into medical school, doing my public health degree, and then of course in training, um, I was constantly sort of aware of those those differences and those those inequities, which became even more obvious for me during my training in OBGYN, um, where I saw you know a lot of inequity. I was I was in Boston seeing patients coming from various parts of Boston. And you could see the differences, right, in people who had access versus not, and you know the higher likelihood of uh, having serious things happen or even dying were very obvious to me. So really throughout my career then, since then, you know, I've always prioritized kind of thinking about not only inequities, but just addressing unmet needs in women's health, because that was another piece of, you know, sort of my training and my career was seeing that there were so many unmet needs. And we can talk about those a little bit more, but uh, this is what has led me, as you talked about the companies that I've worked for, you can see I've tried to focus in on women's health as much as possible and uh, have always wanted to think about ways that we can develop, you know, new treatments, certainly for reproductive health, which we do at, here at Faring, uh, maternal health and, and other, you know, uh, conditions that affect women. And it's not just conditions that affect women only, it's conditions also, you know, many conditions that both men and women have may be different in women, right? Or may be more um, prevalent in women, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, and things like that. So there are, those are, are you know, conditions that uh, some of them we we are thinking about here at Faring as well. So um, these are sort of, for me, continue, you can see the sort of the, the continuation over my career of wanting to address um, public health, wanting to address uh, health in general, uh, and specifically women's health and health inequities. Mm hmm. And, and you, you know, along the way, sort of pre faring you know, you had, uh, you know, mm. quite a a set of experiences. I, I um, again, I was looking in this Mount Holyoke uh, alumni quarterly from about 15 years ago where they were interviewing you. And at the time, I think you were working on the uh, uh, the papilloma vaccine at Merck. Uh, and, and during that, you know, they also sent you, I think, off to Africa to to talk with ministers and heads of state, again, you know, dealing with the, you know, the inequity issues. Um, and then, you know, you're, you're off to biotech after that, uh, working <laughs> yeah. at, at, at a tiny company, but still having major success for developing drugs for preterm labor, uh, for uterine fibroids. Um, talk about some of your large company and very small company experience. I think this sort of rounded you off for everything yes. you're doing now at Faring. Yeah, definitely. So I look, I've just been lucky, really lucky, right? So you know, I never, I, I hadn't planned uh, actually to go into the pharma industry at all. I certainly mentioned previously that, you know, I wanted to have bigger impact, right, beyond taking care of one patient at a time. 
And literally, it was a, an email in my inbox, right, from Merck that was um, sort of looking, you know, I, I think I'm assuming they sent it to basically all the GYN oncologists in the country. <laughs> but I was the one to, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, you know, sort of raise my hand and say, absolutely, I'm interested in this. And that's what led to the work at Merck. And, you know, no better area, right, to have impact than vaccines, right? Um, look at COVID vaccines and the impact there. So, um, so at the time when I joined in Mark, I think 2007, the first um, approval of Gardasil, the HPV vaccine, had happened, but there were additional approvals that Merck was trying to get um, around other indications, other conditions beyond cervical cancer, right, that that uh, the vaccine could impact, right? Because um, although the vaccine's most well-known to prevent cervical cancer, I think what a lot of people may not know is that there are numerous other cancers, right, that are caused by HPV. There's yep. vaginal cancer, vulvar cancer, anal, penile, head and neck, which is head and neck is a, a huge amount of HPV-related uh, um, uh, uh, conditions. So the vaccine has the potential to impact all of those. So, you know, my awareness of that was super, I was super excited by the, the opportunity to join the company. Um, you know, one of the, I think, most obvious, amazing uh, collaborations, uh, right, between uh, the NIH, academics, and industry, right, um, to get this job done is, is, it's just one of the most, for me, incredible examples of that. You know, you had Doug Lowy and John Schiller, right? They were the the two scientists at the NIH way back in the 1990s who had sort of realized, wait, we think that you know these copies of these proteins in the in the in the human papillomavirus could stimulate production of antibodies, right? And right. and so they they developed this and developed this first in animals and in humans, and then you know this is when industry comes in, right? So Merck um, uh, licensed that technology from the NIH, right? So those the, that collaboration is incredible. Um, the work was amazing, you know, the the ability for, for me, just the the ability to have such an impact like so early in my career was, you know, something that I, I think not many people are, are lucky enough to have. Um, and what's been so great for me is like literally 10 years later, after these vaccines, you know, came out of the market, they have now been shown right, to reduce HPV infection rates in the U.S. up to like 64% in some areas. Yep. Um, and then, like I said, there's also huge um, opportunity to to reduce cancers in not just cervical cancer, the original um, approval, but all those other cancers that I mentioned as well. And then you mentioned Agile um, Therapeutics, the, uh, the, the um, company that was developing the contraceptive patch. When I joined that company, they had... Uh, received a complete response letter from the FDA, i.e. the FDA said, we're not ready to approve your product, you have more work to do. So that's that was the reason I joined the company. And so yeah. I had a huge responsibility there to get that product approved. And again, just hard work, teamwork, you know, making the argument um, and working very, very directly with a number of advocacy groups, which I think is really, really important we were able to get that patch through and it's out there, it's being used by women. So that's another really, really exciting, um, exciting thing. I think with Obseva, my, my fortune there was uh, just happened to, you know, I mean, the company was very interesting to me because they had a lot of really interesting products, but you're right. The one um, product that was licensed out actually to Organon uh, for mm -hmm. preterm birth is exciting. Um, you know, still a lot of work to be done there. It's still early days, I would say, but that's another one that I truly, truly hope, you know, ends up making it, right? Mm -hmm. um, another really important collaboration, I would say, is what we do here, you know, mm -hmm. um, at Faring around uh, postpartum hemorrhage, right? So, you know, we have a program called Safe Birth. I don't know if you were going to ask about that later, but that's, you know, working with the World Health Organization and with Mark for Mothers, huge collaboration um, that is really exciting for me in particular because, you know, this is um, a way that I think Faring is basically giving back, right? Giving um, our our uh, our product our, uh, called Carbitocin. It's heat stable. So it's, you know, perfect for developing world countries that don't have, you know, that cold chain. And we're giving it at, at you know, um, prices that people can afford. So mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. sort of giving back and, and addressing some of these unmet needs around the world. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I um, last year I had uh, uh, Teo Aragbagbo on the show from her from others, and he was okay. talking about you know Nigeria and 20 percent of the, you know the world's maternal deaths, and and yeah, the spot ones. I thank you <laughs> for bringing that up as well. So I, I think that's obviously a very important piece of uh, uh, of the story as well. But thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, so you arrive at Ferring, and, and, and as I mentioned. Um, in your bio, broad responsibility, clinical development, medical affairs, reg affairs, pharmacovigilance. Um, and, you know, before we get into sort of some of the things that, that are going on in the pipeline, I, I thought a really, you know, it just I was a couple of weeks ago, there was an article, um, again, that you were interviewed for in, in Vivo, uh, just talking about, talking about the space in general. But um, you highlight something very interesting that, you know, if we put aside uh, the targets and the genes and all the fancy stuff that we think about in terms of drug development. Um, when it comes back to the basics, um, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, um, all the differences between men and women, um, mm -hmm. we 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 still in 2024, as we're almost 2024, take very little of this knowledge into the process of developing drugs for women's health. And and, and you point out that this is a big. Uh, I mean, we got to think more than just you know, the basic drug development stuff. Um, talk a little bit about this and some of these um, challenges that maybe shouldn't be challenges in 2024, but nonetheless are, are important pieces of the, the women's health drug development picture. Yeah. So I think it's important to just kind of look back historically, right, to some extent, meaning that, um, you know, sort of through the years, right, the decades of research, you know, happening in health in general and trying to understand conditions, um, you know, whatever they might be, cancer, heart disease, um, you know, all of that. Most of that work, when you think about, you know, really, really early, early development and just even just even before development of drugs, just trying to understand mechanisms and, and, you know, sort of how does disease happen? Most of that work has been done historically in males, right? So whether it's animals, it's been male animals. Um, and it was even thought at some point, you know what, um, we can't, we shouldn't use female mice because those ovaries get in the way of, you know, <laughs> us understanding this, how this, you know, condition may, you know, sort of manifest itself or how it develops. But that's sort of missing the whole point, right, is that's a difference. Women have ovaries, um, you know, and men don't. And women have menstrual cycles that are very, very important in, term, in terms of hormones going up and down and up and down. And none of that for years and years and years was ever taken to an, into account, right? It's only been 30 years, 30 years since it was basically mandated um, by the NIH that women must be involved in, in clinical trials. That's just 30 years. So it's not been a long time. If you think about, you know, sort of research over decades, um, it, it hasn't been long that we've actually even really had the opportunity to include women, um, you know, at a, sort of an equal level in talking about in clinical trials, right? And that, that um, also... Um, is relevant for underserved populations as well. So that NIH mandate basically um, was both of those things, that women and um, minorities should be included in clinical trials. So what that means is we just don't have a whole lot of information yet on those, those sex differences. Now, there are certainly very, very sharp um, scientists who are working on this, who are looking at those sex differences. And, you know, one of them uh, uh, who talks about this is, I love the way she describes this, which is, you know, it's not only just our, um, you know, the cells that are in our reproductive systems that are different between men and women. Every, every cell in our body, right, in a male or a female is male or female, right? Um, the DNA is the same in every single cell. Mm -hmm. So in the heart, you know, our, our cells are different because ours are, you know, a woman's is, is a female cell. And, you know, so that, so when you think about it that way, you can imagine that there are, there is the potential and we know there is just looking at, you know, some of these really important conditions, we know there are differences. So great examples, um, heart disease, right? When women have a heart attack, um, they present when they go to the emergency room, for instance, and, and they know something really bad is happening. But those symptoms are often not the typical, 
you want to call them typical. We shouldn't call them typical because we have 50-50 male and female, but people think of the typical symptoms of a heart attack, which is, you know, chest pain, it's left arm, you know, sort of, you know, feel weakness. Um, women often don't necessarily even have chest pain, if you can believe it, when they're having a heart attack. They may de describe feeling lightheaded or just feeling strange or, you know, so so it's not unusual for a woman to be sent home from the hospital without even having an EKG and any of those things, right? She goes home, she's having a heart attack. She's more likely to die in that first, in the first year actually of having a heart attack, probably for some of those reasons, because the, you know, the condition might be um, never realized, right? Um, and she could have a silent heart attack and never knows it and then dies a year later. Um, but it could also be just, she didn't get the, she didn't get treatment in time either. So, so that's for me, one really, really interesting example of how, you know, even the heart can be different in terms of how, um, we present with, with various conditions. So there's a ton of work to be done on this. I think there is a lot of work happening on this and then sort of related to that. So that's, you know, sort of how we're different. And then there's, of course, all the conditions that women deal with. Um, that are specific to women. So a number of things, right? Certainly, you know, I can think of, you know, menopause is a great example or uh, preeclampsia, which is a really big killer of women. Mm -hmm. um, we don't understand those, either of those conditions really well. We're doing better with menopause, but for, from a preeclampsia standpoint, there's no treatments at all. Uh, specific for that, you know, condition. Endometriosis is, is another great one. We don't understand exactly what's happening there, and we have really limited treatments there. So, and just a good number to for people to be aware of is, you know, the level of underinvestment too in women's health. Right. So we make up half the population, right? Um, but only one percent, and this is a McKinsey um, article, one percent of the healthcare of the of the two hundred billion dollars spend in healthcare R&D uh, was invested in female specific conditions. And that's female specific conditions outside of oncology. But that's 2020 that, that um, uh, those data are from. So 1% with half of the women's of the world's population being, you know, women, we've got a lot of work to do um, to spend more, uh, you know, uh, into research, of course, and development. Absolutely. You know, while, while we're on this theme of um, differences, again, you know, I, I found it interesting because as I was sort of clicking through the deferring uh, the science and innovation section, I got to the part about the microbiome, which yeah. you know, is sort of a, a new area. And I, you know, I clicked on it. I, I thought I would see sort of traditional microbiome stuff. But uh, specifically, the, the there was the whole section on, on the vaginal microbiome, which Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, I don't have that's a microbiome I don't have. Um, uh, <laughs> but, but it does. But um, you make some really interesting, you know, points here about um, all these. You know, we talked about papillomavirus, of course, but all of these other conditions that uh, you know we haven't thought about the microbiome. Wait, we know it's there. <laughs> so there's a lot of it. Um, but connected to all of these conditions, uh, say a few words about this because I, you know, I think the microbiome is um, hot as a just a topic in general. But the fact that um, uh, vaginal uh, microbial imbalance, this dysbiosis that uh, you talk about, uh, I think it's a very interesting area of investigation. I wonder if you could say a, a little bit about it. Yeah, for sure. One of the reasons I I came to Faring was the microbiome uh, thing. So and and I came a little bit at risk because uh, you know. Rebiota, which is our approved product, mm -hmm. um, the first ever, super exciting, the first ever live biotherapeutic, nice. uh, wasn't yet approved when I joined, but I was pretty sure it would be. I'm not sure how I knew that, but um, <laughs> you know, it just felt like it was going to be approved. So that was just super, super exciting, right? To be to really have that first live biotherapeutic, um, you know, ever approved by the FDA for a very, very important condition, which is, you know, recurrent uh, Clostridium difficile, which both men and women get, right? So, um, so super exciting. And, you know, we kind of think of rebiota in many ways as not necessarily just that particular product, but really one potentially as sort of a platform, if you think about it, mm -hmm. for multiple potential other, uh, you know, um, indications 
related to the microbiome. So you obviously mentioned one, which is the vaginal microbiome. And indeed, we are very much interested in that um, a lot because uh, the microbiome or dysbiosis, I should say, in the vaginal microbiome has been uh, connected to a number of conditions. One is recurrent um, BV or uh, bacterial vaginosis. Um, now that doesn't kill people. It's really awful when women have, you know, continuous infections. Mm. It's really annoying and really uncomfortable. Um, but like you don't die of that. However, um, the, the vaginal microbiome has been also linked to preterm delivery, preterm birth. And certainly people, babies do die because of, because of, you know, being born way too early. So we're really kind of honed in on that potential um, mm -hmm. indication, right, for treatments um, in, the, in the vaginal microbiome. Uh, it's early, early, early days. Let's be clear, right? There's a whole lot of work to be done, but this is certainly something that Faring is very, very interested in. And, you know, beyond that, I mean, there's there are countless, uh, countless publications now. Um, if you sort of, you know, look at, you know, microbiome, which it sounds like you did, um, or you go to, you know, PubMed and put microbiome in there. I mean, there's, there's so many, you know, these are smaller not necessarily even trials, a lot of them. And these are some of these are case reports where, you know, people are looking at the microbiome for, you know, obesity, for heart disease, for uh, autism even. So there's a lot of really interesting potential indications there um, mm -hmm. based on this platform. So super exciting. Absolutely. And, you know, obviously you're, you know, Fering is is known, um, you know, as a world leader in assistive reproductive technologies, and you know, every mm -hmm. you know, you're really good at at drugs that stimulate ovaries and induce ovulation. And as you were talking, you know, on the other end, obviously, uh, preventing preterm labor. Uh, but one of the other interesting things that you point out in the In Vivo article is um, some of the mysteries that that we still have in front of us. And one of the you point out is, you know, after we're good at creating that embryo. What yeah. happens after that? We're not really, we don't know much about it all. Uh, there's, we've been studying it for whatever, hundreds of years. Um, you talk about artificial intelligence. You talk about some of these mm -hmm. new tools that uh, are kind of hot that we've, we've spoken on the show. Uh, talk a little bit about where you see um, some of the sort of the, the the tech, the tech bio side of things helping yeah, out sure. in, in, in this area. Yeah, I think a good point that you made uh, is that, you know, to some extent, it feels like, um, you know, from a therapeutic standpoint, other than the, you know, what happens after that embryo goes into the uterus, you know, from a stimulation standpoint, it's kind of hard to imagine how much better that can get, right, therapeutically, I mean. So yes, we are looking at, you know, what else is there, um, you know, beyond that. So as you mentioned, um, you know, we Bering actually has a product that sort of looks at, um, you know, potentially improving the the outcomes, improving the likelihood of a uh, of a live birth, right? Following um, following the the embryo being placed back in the uterus. That's something we're not actively working on on at the moment, but certainly something that um, we have interest in. And then, of course, the digital piece, right, which is huge. So we're really very, very focused on ways that we can improve, right, um, that experience for patients, as well as providers too, right? So, you know, there's some things we're already doing um, from a technological standpoint, from a digital standpoint, that are aimed to really kind of provide resources, information to patients. So a number of really interesting initiatives there. Um, really to support patients across that journey, because the fertility journey is really, really tough, right? Um, it can often take a long time. There can be often many, many failures before, you know, a woman gets pregnant. So it's not uh, not easy at all. So um, some of the, the things that we're doing from a technology standpoint, we have um, a uh, program called Fertility Out Loud. That is a what we're, we call a kind of a social community. It's a platform. Um mm -hmm provides um, women and their, their families with resources, with information, with guidance, just helps them kind of to take action. One of the problems is that's out there in terms of infertility is that it takes a long time sometimes for once a woman just realizes, or I should say once a, you know, a, a couple, and it's not just women, it's, you know, um, 
just realizes that, you know, either for a woman that she's lost her fertility or there's a male issue, it can take a long time for that, that family to get to a fertility specialist, um, way too long than it should, right? So part of fertility out loud is to kind of help with that, to, to uh, sort of help people kind of take action and find a specialist. Mm-hmm. We also have fertility house calls that actually connects people with a specialist or a clinic to help kind of get that process going. And then we also have um, fertility outreach, which is kind of another support resource. Um, it's kind of, it's text-based. It, it gives, you know, what we call aspiring parents, right? With really personalized guidance and advice, they get actually a coach, a trained fertility coach that can sort of help them, you know, with, with providing information and guidance. So we're doing a lot from a technological standpoint. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, we're also very, concerned about, you know, the fact that even though, like I said, people sometimes tend to think, oh, we're, we're good, we've solved the problems of fertility. That's true for some, but there's, there's definitely an access issue, right? So there are many, many, many families out there who would want to have a child but can't because they can't afford it, or they, they aren't near enough to a facility and so on. So we're working very, very hard on the access part, right? Um, and so we're doing a lot of work with, you know, advocacy groups. We have a, a great program with Resolve, which is one of the biggest advocacy groups around fertility. We work very, very closely with them to advocate, right, for better education and better access to fertility care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, well, while we're, while we're on the way, you, you mentioned, you know, again, we were back talking about the differences you, you you mentioned menopause and and this has kind of been a um um a, an, an interesting area not just from the perspective obviously of developing interventions that that help mm-hmm. with the the sequelae of of menopause but the fact that um menopause represents this very interesting sort of form of aging uh <laughs> in, in humans and female humans of course that um you know is unlike um, the rest of, you know, sort of typical biologic aging. And I just, it was just interesting. I mean, it is confidential or anything like that. Any, any interesting things going on? Cause I know you got a lot going on in the genomic space as well. Anything interesting happening that, that excites you in terms about sort of studying the, uh, the biologic processes behind menopause that give us some idea on maybe how to delay it or, um, get further insights into sort of the, just the aging process, um, behind it. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a very, very, very interesting topic. It's not something that Faring is actively working on at the moment, um, but certainly looking at what's happening out there in the field. um, You know, I think there's a lot of really, really interesting research going on. Um, You know, we look at uh, certain hormones that exist, you know, uh, AMH is a great example, whether yeah. that may have something to do with, you know, um, the timing of menopause and so on. Yeah. Um, but no, specifically, that's currently at least not an area um, we are actively working on. But again, you know, because we have such great interest in in women's health, we're we're certainly always looking out um, for, for, you know, um, solutions, right, Mm -hmm. to that problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm... um... I'm sitting here in, in in downtown Center City, Philadelphia, and a couple blocks that way is uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia, um, which is making some waves uh, in, in recent days in the area of artificial womb technology. Um, I have uh, recently had guests on the show that are playing around with induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, trying to create uh, cells that or oocyte-like uh, from mm-hmm. sort of somatic tissues. A lot mm-hmm. of things going on on the sort of the bleeding edge now. Um, yep. What what gets you excited in terms of when you're looking out five, 10 years, thinking about this space? Um, at the same time, what what, what scares you? <laughs> what what yeah. are the things that maybe, uh, uh, maybe it's a little too soon for, but um, <laughs> again, I'd love to, based on your expertise and these things happening, um, love, to, love to get your thoughts on, on, on and all things sort of in the coming decade. Yeah, I mean, a lot of really, really exciting stuff. I think you mentioned, right, uh, you know, stem cells and, you know, potentially deriving oocytes, right, eggs, basically, um, from stem cells, um, possibly uh, deriving sperm even, right, from uh, stem cells and and men that may not, you know, that where that may be an issue in terms of uh, their fertility. And like you said, a lot 
of really interesting stuff going on around, you know, generating ovarian cell lines um, that then somehow you can sort of master, right, to um, to mimic the certain function of the reproductive sense, uh, system cells. So, and that's, you know, replication in how, you know, oocytes or eggs naturally mature in the body and then figuring out ways to be able to do that outside of the body, right? Um, really interesting work there. What I will say about that is I'm super excited about it. Um, it's all very early stuff, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's a ways off. So yeah. I think for people who might hear about this um, around, you know, stem cell derived oocytes, for example, the one thing I would say is it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's amazing. It's not going to happen tomorrow. So I yeah. think that's, mm -hmm. that's the one thing, right. Is just to be sure that people understand that these, you know, these, and these advances are take a, a, a long time. Right. And then of course, once you are able potentially to generate in a, in a dish, right, a mature, viable egg, that's one story or part of the story. The next part of the story is, does that viable egg that's in, you know, um, in the dish actually become a baby, right, if you put it into the uterus? So that's another big question that's going to have to be answered, and that's going to take a lot of research, a lot of clinical trials, a lot of, you know, and, and from a safety perspective, super, super important. So to the question that you asked about what scares me, it's, I'm not scared. I don't think that's the right word about, you know, but you're, you're always concerned, right? When you're right. developing new things around the safety part, the yeah. efficacy, that's one thing. If it works, great. But to be in, to be sure that safety is maintained is, is really important. Um, another thing just, you know, in terms of futuristic, and this, I, I wouldn't necessarily call this one futuristic, um, you know, what I'm going to talk about, but I do think it's it's extremely important is, you know, sort of this topic that we've, we've touched on a little bit around sort of health equity and diversifying yep. clinical trials. I think that that's something in the next 10, 15 years, I would hope um, that we're able to do better with, right? I think FDA for, for sure has recognized this for years as a really important thing, but in the last probably what since around 2016 or so, they've really started to kind of put out guidances and, you know, really kind of saying, folks, you, you need to actually do this. You need to make sure you have diversity in your clinical trials. And certainly at Faring, we're, we are actively thinking about that, starting to work on the diversity part. And part of that, if you want to talk about the futuristic stuff, and I wouldn't call it, again, I wouldn't call it, it's not futuristic anymore because it's actually really happening in the industry. Right. It's still, you know, there's a lot to be worked out, um, but a big piece of that potentially in terms of diversifying clinical trials is decentralizing clinical trials, right? Yes. And that's where all of the, um, you know, digital stuff comes in and, you know, allowing people to have a go through a clinical trial and maybe go to the clinical trial center one time. And then from there on, be able to do blood work, you know, locally to be able to send in information digitally instead of having to go all the way into the, the clinical trial center, just making things easier and potentially giving more access. The thing I think about that I'm a little scared about there is that if you think about it, a person participating, participating in a decentralized trial really has to have access now to the internet, right? And they need to right. maybe have a, a, a phone, a mobile phone that works, right? So there is a potential of missing out actually and losing people from a diversity standpoint because they don't have those things, right? So I think we have to be careful about assuming that decentralized trials are going to be great for everyone. I think it's a great thing to do. We should be doing that, but we've got to think about the the folks who might lose out um, in, in taking that approach, right? Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I'll come back to sort of the technology, um, because you did mention AI. Yep. And let's face it, the world is, a it's AI right now. I mean, yeah. I, you know, and it's incredible. I mean, I just learned today, I hadn't heard about this, but one of my colleagues had put together, forget what it's called, you might know about it, it's something like logos. It's it's like AI that will put together a logo for you. Okay. Whatever okay. it is that you might, I forget the exact name, but I, this is the first time I heard it today. I was like, my gosh, you know, now you can just like put like logo in and boom, there's a nice right. logo for you. 
chat GPT, which I will admit I, I, I use here and there. I'm like, oh, let's, let's see what chat GPT says, you know, about how to say this or whatever. Um, and then AI, I think, has a massive, massive um, potential to affect how we do clinical trials, right? So there's a lot going around around how you can better, um, you know, find the right patients for your study, for your clinical trial through AI. You have the potential to be able to uh, identify which patients are more likely to stay in your trial, right? That's a big problem for clinical trials is the, you know, discontinuation, patients start and then they don't finish the trial. Right. Um, if you can know from the beginning who's kind of a little more likely to stay in, you know, that might be helpful. Now, FDA will maybe see that as like, wait a minute, that means you're you're selecting the better patients. So there's always the, the downside potentially, right? right? Um, but yeah, lots of really, really exciting things, I think, around AI um, in the future. And, and, and I'm glad you brought up that digital health part because I, I personally think it's fascinating how, you know, these distributed clinical trial models are showing up everywhere from, you know, yeah. our, our, our pharmacies to sort of the yeah. Yeah. digital health company. So it's it's going to be an interesting, uh, it's going to be yeah. an interesting time. Yeah, um, the pharmacies have jumped in now. Yeah, yeah amazing. Everyone's involved. <laughs> um, well, coming back to the future for a moment, because, you know, you mentioned the part about the um, uh, sort of the, the health equity uh, side of sort of clinical development and, and you're doing this interesting thing with these grants. Um, just, just coming back to sort of the basics of, of, of partnering, again, thinking of uh, uh, the small innovators that may be listening to the show. What What is um, an organization? Obviously, you know, you're the chief science officer and, and, and probably have a lot of business development and clinical development folks reporting to you, telling you about the next best thing that people are knocking on the door to, to pitch to but what do you typically look for in 2024 in terms of uh, the sort of the small innovative partners, the the young biotech companies? You're looking at early stage discovery, only looking at sort of clinical stage assets. What is a uh, for the for the for the younger companies, the, the smaller startups that are wanting to get into the space? What a what is Ferring what? So we certainly look at everything, right? We okay. have a group that looks very very specifically at earlier stage um, assets. So we we take a look. Um, we also, of course, are very interested in later stage, right? Because sure. clearly, you know, if you can find a later stage asset that is, you know, has a very high likelihood of success in terms of approval and commercial success, of course, that's equally as important. Um, that from a from a timing perspective as to when that becomes, uh, you know, potentially um, positive, you know, uh, when we begin to see the potential for revenue from that, obviously the time frame is way shorter, right? So right. Um, that said, Faring is a company that is, you know, very sort of, you know, focused on the science. Um, we are, you know, we want to be innovative. We, we were in fact, just to mention, you know, we were actually named among the world's most innovative companies by Fast Company this year. So, yep. so you know, we, we certainly believe that we are known as an innovative company as well. So, you know, and if you think of many of the products that, um, you know, sort of the, the certainly in, in the fertility space, I mean, these are, you know, products that some of them started in pairing, but a lot of them are, are products that came in much earlier and then, you know, sort of that we carry through, right? So, um, so I would say to the smaller companies, you know, we're looking we all across the, the spectrum in terms of, um, you know, where you are uh, with your development. That said, um, you know, we certainly it's obvious, right, we have certain areas that we're particularly interesting, interested in, right? Um, so fertility, of course. And remember, I mentioned that it's really the um, the real innovation now around fertility that, that I would say we're interested in, right? Because from a therapeutic standpoint, you know, I think we've sort of, there are some things out there, but what's really going to, I think, change things in terms of, you know, the fertility space are these other parts of the journey, right, that I talked yeah. about, yeah. Um, as well as, of course, the things like stem cell derived oocytes that would truly, truly change things, right? So we are we are very interested in, in, you know, assets, even from the very, very early stage that have the potential to really transform, right, yep. an, an area. Obviously, microbiome is, is something we're very interested in. And then, of course, with our bladder cancer product that I don't think we've talked about today um, in your oncology, uh, 
that is, of course, now a space for us that we're very, very interested in as well. You know, I, I neglected to mention at the beginning of the show that in addition to all your responsibilities, you are also the uh, current president of the American Medical Women's Association, right. <laughs> also a member of the board of directors. I know you were, just a couple of months ago, you had your annual meeting, but um, can you just say a couple of words about um, the AMWA and then along the lines of sort of uh, public facing stuff, if you have any other uh initiatives uh conferences you're going to be presenting at places that uh we can run into you listen to you meet you possibly anything else on the calendar that uh as, as we get close to 2024 please yeah so of course and uh american medical women's association is uh has been for a long time an important uh, organization for me uh, you know i first became aware of the organization as a medical student and uh, in fact, the current executive director, Eliza Chin, of uh, the organization was my classmate in medical school, if you can believe that. So, so we, it's been you know, just a blast to work with her um, in this current role. Um, AMWA is the oldest of the women's doctors, women's physicians organizations, I believe in the world, certainly in the US. So it's been around for over 100 years and you know, has really you know, a couple of pieces of its mission, which is to support women doctors, right, to improve the lives of women doctors, which is a big deal right now. Um, you know, women doctors, as in many parts of the industry, you know, sort of not just health, but but across all industries, uh, women are tending to leave the workplace right now for various right. reasons. But so we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can support women doctors. And then, of course, we're very focused on improving women's health as well, right? So, um, so there's kind of that that double um, uh, part of the mission. Really exciting things that we're doing. Um, we are. Uh, I represent when I when I go to certain conferences and things like that. As you mentioned, um, I oft I'm, I'm generally mostly you know sort of there for bearing, but often try to throw in there you know don't forget the AMWA because right. I'm often in situations or places where there are a lot of women doctors. And of course, we we as an organization want to grow. And you know, I'm I'm specifically or particularly interested in women doctors who are leaders. So, as an example, um, just that just this past these in these past few days, I was at the American Association of um, Physician Leadership. It's the AAPL, okay. um, where I um, was a keynote speaker and then spent a few days really kind of actually doing some interesting courses, but also just talking to a lot of women doctors and encouraging them, you know, to join the organization, because I think we're doing really great things. Um, what sorts of things are coming up? Well, um, we continue to um, uh, meet and talk about the um, huge effort uh, that was recently announced in Senegal, actually, which is a collaboration between the Gates Foundation and NIH. Okay. Uh, called the uh, called the Innovation Equity Forum. Uh, that's been sort of people have been posting on this a lot and stuff. So that was a an, about a year plus long um, uh, project to kind of define globally across the globe, high income, low income countries. What are the sort of the key needs uh, for women mm -hmm. in women's health? What are the you know um, and and sort of developing what we're calling you know sort of a a list of kind of opportunities that various funders could um, could take up. So smaller projects, ones that could be done in say two to three, five years. Um, and that was presented recently in Senegal. And then that, but this is something that I think uh, folks should be aware of um, mm -hmm. for anyone who's interested in doing some sort of smaller projects, US globally uh, to improve women's health. So that's the IEF, the Innovation Equity Forum. And that's, you would be able to find that online. Um, I'll be speaking at a small, very, very small sort of gathering. I wouldn't even call it a conference, but it's relevant because there's a, a an organization called WHAM. It's W H A M okay. uh, that was started by a woman named uh, Carolee, who uh, is most famous for her jewelry <laughs> line, mm -hmm. um, but who has become recently really, really interested in women's health. So she's doing, uh, you know, a lot of work. Um, collaborating, you know, with some of the same people that were involved with the, the IEF um, uh, project, again, to just amplify the need for more investment in women's health. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I'll also be speaking at the Connor Center, which is the Connor Center for Women's Health, which is at um, uh, Harvard Medical School at Brigham and Women's, which is going to have its annual um, uh, symposium, I think they call it. And that's coming up in a, a month, I think the end of November. And that's something that anyone who's in that sort of the Boston area could um, participate in. Um, and that's another area, another, I think, venue, right, for a lot of conversation about um, women's health. And it gets you back to, uh, gets me back <laughs> the, begin- to the very beginning. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, exactly. what, what a fascinating journey. I mean, just, uh, I, I just so enjoyed listening to the story, um, not just everything you've been doing, but clearly the, the future is is quite exciting. And yeah. um, you know, whether we're talking biologic or information technology or everything in between, it's going to be um you know, a, a fascinating future for women's health and, and, yeah. and you championing it. So um, wish you the best with this. I, I, I hope to do a follow up at some point as, as you continue to, to lead the company in this direction. Um, again, awesome. as everybody um, is going to be listening to uh, this particular episode uh, across the various podcasts or watching on our YouTube channel. Again, you've been spending time with Dr. Elizabeth Garner, Chief Scientific Officer, United States Furring Pharmaceuticals, doing really amazing things to help people around the world build families and live better lives. Um, Elizabeth, I want to thank you again for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. Obviously, thank you for everything you do. And as we like to say on our show, um, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow via what you do. Really a great story. Thank you so much. It was great fun. <laughs>